I realize that being an artist is not something you make a choice for. It's something you realize in yourself. And I ha I've had that all my life. I don't know when it was ever not there. But I grew up in Halifax, went to school in Halifax, and uh, began studying art in Halifax. I was a, just a little kid when I studied art, like four or five years old. And the uh, Nova Scotia Art College had a Saturday morning class for children. Coming back here, I can see where the aesthetics in my work really began. In those days, there was not much of a market for art, so you couldn't expect to make a living off of art. But I never really abandoned art, even though I went to work for the Nova Scotia Department of Trade and Industry for four or five years. I was still involved in art, but it was while there that uh, I got engaged with the Nova Scotia Handcraft Center. And while I was there, I just accidentally got interested in ceramics. It seemed like a very, very interesting thing to do, and, and the uh, artistic dimension of it impressed me a lot. So that's how I actually got into it. Well, the clay which I use is uh, porcelain. And porcelain is not a naturally occurring clay that you can go out and dig it, like you can dig earthenware clay or stonework clays. In our hemisphere, you have to make it. In uh, China, it occurs naturally. I make my own. Once the clay is mixed, according to the formula uh, for this porcelain body, then it has to be aged. And uh, I need at least six months aging. But after it's aged, then it has to be homogenized. And I use uh, hand wedging, and I also use equipment like a pug mill, which helps to de-air it and to homogenize it. For real quality throwing, you still have to, at least I still have to, uh, hand wedge it, and I do, do it all, small pieces or large pieces. In those days, uh, uh, Halifax was a very barren spot where art was concerned. There were, uh, there were very few people painting, actually. And I think through our little gallery, perhaps we promoted more among the young people, the young painters, the young students, got them more interested in a broader scope of painting and a broader scope of art. Speaker's gallery was the only gallery in, uh, in Halifax and maybe one of the few ga art galleries in Canada at that time. But it was more than just a place that showed art. It was more than just a place where you bought art supplies. Uh, it was like a center for anybody interested in art. But something like Swickers, even though I was not like a professional artist earning my living at art, uh, the uh, center of myself, which was an artist, was stayed alive because I related to art through that, uh, that gallery. I related to people who were interested in art. So it kept it alive in me. Actually, the first exhibition of ceramics I ever had was in their gallery. The interest in pottery at that time wasn't very tremendous, but uh, he was uh, he did he was a native boy, so he got a good crowd to his show. He sold a few of his pieces. Well, throwing is basically centering the clay on the wheel, making an opening, and then throwing throwing the walls and forming the shape that you want. But it's the, the trick is to develop the capacity to, to throw the walls thinner and thinner while at the same time you're making the shape. When I go to throw, I, I don't know what that shape's going to turn out to be. I start it off, and then I begin to feel it, and I follow the line, and I change with the line, I change it. And then if it gets to a place where it's not working, I break it down again. I use a technique of throwing and coiling, which is a very ancient oriental technique, which is throwing the uh, part way and then adding a coil and throwing it the rest of the way. Generally, the coil and throw technique does not work with porcelain because the difference in the moisture content tends to separate the two. But over years of work, I found a method of uh, helping the two of them 
to bond together by using a deflocculated clay. Well, a plate, uh, I usually throw it, let it dry, and then I throw it to the thinness that I want, and then I use a um, stick or anything I can find to lean it over to the cantilevered form that I like. As a young man, I was getting lost, and I wasn't much more than, than an emerging art student. But uh, I did get a little lost, and then when I was in business for four or five years, I realized that was not me, and I had to get out of it. And so I had to make some radical change. So I made the radical change of getting out of Nova Scotia totally, first by going to Europe, and then while I was in Europe, I went to England, and it was there somebody made a suggestion that I try, as a young man, to give a couple of years of my life in a monastic context. And that's all I had intended when I, when I went to the monastery, was spend a year or two of not being engaged in anything except uh, spiritual life. Curiously enough, when I was in the monastery, three weeks after I arrived, somebody gave us a kill. So that was like some kind of sign that brought me back to art. And originally, I just worked to uh, help the monastery with its income. But gradually, the root of myself as an artist began to emerge. And I began to work again, use that medium as an expression for my own artistic intuition. The monastery at that time was perfect for me and was an absolutely magical place. It was like Shangri-La, I hated to leave it, and I was always anxious to get back to it. And I stayed there in the monastery for 25 years, till 1983. After the piece is finished, it has to be very slowly air-dried, depending on the size. A very large piece might take up to several months to dry it properly and then it's bisqued. And if it's not air dried properly, uh, then uh, in the bisque firing, the um, steam builds up in the piece and will make it explode. And after it's bisque fired, uh, then it's ready, it can be stored. It cannot be broken down again into clay. It has undergone a substantial change. That means it's an entirely different substance than it was when it was clay. It's now literally a soft fired, porcelain body, and they can wait for years. I mean, I've done some pieces which have sat on the shelf in the bisque state for literally years, because I just don't have the feeling for glazing that particular piece. We met Thomas in Vermont. We had seen a little piece of his work at a little gallery gift shop. And we didn't know anything about him, and they asked, said that if we liked it so much, why didn't we go to Weston and meet the man who did it? I'm sure we'd think the pottery was marvelous if we didn't know the man. But I don't think we would be so dedicated to the pottery had we not known the man. In 1972, at the Springfield Art Museum, a friend of ours, Donald Riker, gave a show of Brother Thomas's. And Neither Patty nor I were aware of Brother Thomas at that time. Well, I just thought they were absolutely incredibly beautiful. We came in late in the day, and it was dark, and the museum was lighted up, and they were like jewels. For me, my work is not completed until it's shared with others. I'm like a messenger. I mean, the, the message is not for the messenger. So my work has to go out to others. That's its commission to go forth and to bring something to other people. I had a history of buying porcelains and ceramics for many years, but mostly for ourselves, never for the gallery, because I felt there was a tremendous difference between what we were showing and what pottery was about. So we didn't really consider showing it. We just bought it for ourselves and took it home. It was during a time of transition for him, which is what I was unaware of, and the relationship began to grow over a period of time because he was then at the Western Priory. And all of his work was shown there and available through the Priory. It was a problem as to whether or not, as a commercial gallery, we could get involved. And it was clear that we could not because he already had a 
proprietary relationship with the Priory. Over a period of time, it became clear that that relationship was in trouble, that there were thoughts and doubts on his part as to whether he was going to stay there. The creative person is a free person. Monasteries, after all, are group living, community living, and the freedom of the individual can be lost there. And the moment a person encounters the reality of freedom, what it means to the human being, it can be a torture. I mean, you can no longer deny it that, that you have to pursue being a free person. And if there's not enough space for you as an individual to expand in that particular circumstance, then you have to, to move. The glazes are combinations of minerals, oxides of minerals. And most of my glazes are based on uh, feldspars, and that's a particular type of material which already combines several materials. And then uh, alumina is added to that in the form of clay, uh, china clay, and um, kaolins, and then the silica, which is the glass forming material. Sometimes you can get them from a manufacturer in particle size. Other times you have to grind them down to a finer particle size. Water is a suspension vehicle. And uh, the glazes are mixed in that suspension vehicle and sprayed on the pieces, or poured on the pieces, or painted on the pieces. My normal procedure for uh, glazing is to spray the glaze on. I put it into a spray gun, and I have a compressor, which uh, gives enough force for it to be sprayed evenly on the pot. You have to get it on the right thickness for that particular glaze. There is no one standard thickness. I do the over decoration afterwards, and I put a, um, a gum material in between because the glazes are very dry, so that when I pour iron on a piece, it doesn't wash the glaze off underneath. But it took years to find out how to do that. Actually, I got into glazing uh, when I was in the monastery, and we, I was making pottery for sale in the monastery for the community's income. Well, we had no money to buy glazes, so I made the glazes out of ordinary things you find in the kitchen, like bicarbonate of soda, or I'd grind the silica up from sand on the property, chip up chore girl pads, which were pure copper, and put that in the glaze. So I'm, I'm always interested in in extending those glazes or developing new things. Like, for example, this, is, this glaze is kind of like my signature tune. And again, I made it in the circumstances of the environment in which I lived. And it was a museum director who came and told me what glaze it was. It was a Honan Temoku. Uh, the Chinese made this type of glaze in a northern part of China. But uh, I didn't set out to make a Honan Temoku. It was one of those coincidences. I was already making it before I realized what it was. And that came out of the environment. But oh, uh, since then, I've developed an iron yellow glaze, and that's from pure iron. And that's very original. The Chinese had never done anything like that. I think uh, his treatment of, of the glaze is ex extraordinary. Um, things that uh, have not been achieved or have not been experienced by, by potters in, in, in the Far East. Yet Brother Thomas has, has made a breakthrough. And that's quite, quite, quite a wonderful a, a contribution to, to the world of ceramic art. And uh, the remarkable uh, artworks created by Brother Thomas in pottery form is that he seemed to be so able in combining the best of West and the best of from the East. Well, I had never been to the Orient, so I wanted to go, not for technical reasons, not to go and learn how to do this or do that, but just for the uh, aesthetic impact on me and what that would do to me and uh, how it would enter my spirit, how it would uh, 
enhance my sense of being a person of the world. So going to Japan was like the first entry into that experience. And it made a very, very powerful impression on me, both as a person and as an artist, because the, the Japanese potters that I met there uh, really received me like an artist. I had a portfolio of my work. The meetings with them were with all the Japanese living national treasures that I wanted to see, and it was set up by the American Embassy. So I met the finest of those men. The idea of having national living treasure is a unique way to preserve the art and works of special talented artists and craft persons. Those are chosen during their lifetimes while they are living. And it was the same with all of them. They were, they were all added something, something to my realization and understanding and expansion of what I want to be as a person and as, as an artist. So it was a very uh, profound experience, Japan was for me. Besides just the general sights and sounds of a different culture, of a culture that was in tune with what was beautiful and brought it into their lives, they saved just to buy a very expensive tea bowl, like most of us save to buy a car or a, or a house or something. It was a very powerful contemplative experience for me. I stack my kill according to the pieces that I have to put in there. Some are large, some are small. The stacking of my kill becomes a very hazardous process. I have to uh, stack very precariously, sometimes on two and three stilts, where, where, which is very, really taking a big risk. But stacking the kill is very important because not only that risk factor, but also uh, where they are in the kill is very important. If I'm working on a test glaze, I will test them in all those quarters, on all those levels, till I find the optimum place for that glaze. When I start to think about it, I do a, uh, uh, I do a design of where, where the pieces will fit in the kill, and they're based on, I measure them, I measure their height, and I measure what space is left over and what pieces can, could go up there and so forth. So I work it out that way. Then when, they're, when I have finished the firing, I, uh, I note on this kill stacking sketch um, whether they were good in that spot or whether they weren't in that spot. So it becomes a continuous record, several, several years in here. When you're a potter and have 10 tons of equipment to deal with, it isn't as though you can pick up your sketch pad or your paint and easels and go off and work in an attic. Uh, you need space, and you need proper space. And, well, after leaving the monastery, I didn't have that kind of a place to set up again. And I had to look and search and hope for something to emerge again so I could work again. But that was over a year from the time I had stopped working until I began to work again. We sensed that he needed a place to go, and we have told him he's always welcome. He's a family member, really. He had some qualms about that, but it's a very relaxed, casual family situation. I think he, he felt he could come in and be trusting, and, and uh, it would be a quiet place for him. There's the wonderful reality of friends who are available to you, who are there not for any other reason but you yourself and your life, and they say, hang on, I, I've had this experience, there will be something will come along, uh, something will, will help you out of this situation. And it does. But while you're there, it's an experience of really spiraling down, especially for an artist. And what I, what I fe felt most at that time was a gradual eroding of my will to work. That's when I started to do a regular day's work in my notebook, working on glazes, working on these pots that I, I never made. So that went on for a whole year. And I have a piece I'm very fond of that uh, is in the museum collection in Boston. I was in Boston and I was very depressed and I decided to go over to the 
Boston Museum of Fine Arts uh, to meet a friend there. And while I was there, I went down into the galleries and to visit this piece. And I was standing in front of the, the case where it was, looking at it, feeling very dejected. And uh, I had some sense of this woman in the gallery with me. And she bounced over alongside of me, looked at the piece with me, and then turned to me and said, don't you wish you could do something like that? And I looked at her and said, yes, I wish I could. And eventually I did, again. The firing process is a very long process, 20 hours. And uh, I have various instruments. And when it reaches certain points, I do certain things. It's basically a process of controlling the amount of air flowing through the kiln. I keep a, a record of the firing through the whole thing. There are, there's a front part of it, which is simply a heating, slow heating up, uh, and it's an oxidizing period. But then the, the transmutation of the colors occur at a certain point, and that's in a reduction stage of the kill, where oxygen is reduced in the kill and other gases take its place. And those gases are the gases which affect the minerals in the glazes and cause their color to transmute from one to the other. The specific difference of uh, the potter's art is the fire. And it's the only art in which the artist turns over uh, the completion of his work to an agency outside of himself. The firing is the last process and the, probably the most critical because of that. You have, to, um, you have to be in rhythm with the firing. Control it to some extent, but not control it to the extent that there's no space for surprise. There's no space for uh, the unexpected. If you work with the fire, those things can be very present and can keep the work moving and growing organically. I wrote Thomas a letter inviting him to Erie if he wanted to come. I said, Thomas, if you want to use uh, a part of this warehouse, we'd be glad to let you do it. But it's in the inner city. Now, I happen to think that making great beauty in the inner city could change the world. So I did not want to come to Erie. Nobody wanted me to come to Erie but nothing was opening up and I was gradually losing my will to work. And so I took it and I came and, and then magical things began to happen. And as the work started again, Thomas moved right up, right up the psychological, emotional, spiritual scale. And overnight was this beautiful, serene, happy, settled, contented, presence among us. This was the kind of an environment that helps to nourish my work. It's a community of prayer uh, and a community uh, was devoted to the Benedictine principles. And my work took off because here I found the measure of freedom that I needed as a creative person. I'm not an integrated part of the community, but I'm one with the community, both in spirit and in heart. Community gives him uh, the base uh, and the challenge and the depth, the spiritual depth he needs to wrestle with what's inside him. The cooling takes three days normally, but um, I sometimes get in there a little before the three days. <laughs> but uh, technically it should to be allowed to cool down for about three days until the pieces can be handled by hand. That's, that's the traditional method of telling when you can get in the kill. And because I do a lot of experimentation, pieces that work wonderfully on test tiles when they get on a larger piece, because the piece retains the heat longer or for some other reason, uh, the, the glaze doesn't work on it. Well, those pieces have to go. And so I break them. I also break them because aesthetically they're they don't, do not achieve what I feel interiorly. They don't match my own intuition. They do not speak to me of what I'm trying to do.
Well, sometimes I say I'm, I'm not really doing art, I'm doing theology. But it's a statement of hope that that's what I'm doing, that I am communicating those things that speak of God. In philosophy, they speak of accidents, those signs of the reality that we encounter first. And uh, one word for them is the transcendentals. It's a, it's a polysyllabic word that scares people off, but it's a very con one of the most concrete. It, it points to one of the most concrete experiences that we have as human beings. And it points to what is beautiful, what is good, what is true, and what unites and does not divide. It is just in being faithful to the work that the work is born. It's not in setting goals, external goals, but in trying to measure up to the interior goals. That constitutes the real process of art. I had this dream of an absolutely perfect pot. It was very simple shape, pure white. It was so simple, so pure, that it was almost not there. And for years, I pursued that. During my tiger years, I had all that energy. I pursued it and pursued it to finally the dream faded and the effort to try to reproduce it disappeared also. Then when I was in Japan, I realized uh, after the experiences that I had in Japan that uh, that white pot was myself. And then I realized that it was myself that I was trying to make pure, better, uh, a more beautiful person, a more truthful person, a person concerned with uniting and not dividing what he encounters and meets along the journey in this world. So it stood, it is a metaphor for me, for myself.